Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this Red Gamer Digital video, we have a whole deluge of Ryzen rumors. We're going to be starting things out with the 7 1700, more specifically on the specifications of it, pricing, and so on. But we're then going to move on to voltage and overclocking because some information has leaked onto the internet. So, first things first, let's talk about the 7 1700. We did tackle some of this yesterday, however, yet another online retailer has popped up showing more information on the processor, and it's actually scarily good if it does perform as advertised. In other words, um, we get benchmarks in reality of what AMD have shown us and what the leaks have shown. So the R, sorry, the, I keep saying R7, which is just completely wrong, the Ryzen 7 1700 is going to be costing a 320 US dollars and comes with 8 cores, 65 watts and 3.7 gigahertz. Now, the really crazy thing about all of this is that it obviously has SMT, but just the single thread performance according to AMD, uh, we're talking on a clock for clock basis here, is going to be equivalent to Skylink. Now, given that KB Lake is essentially the same performance as Skylink, obviously it has slightly higher clocks, slightly better for multimedia. It's just absolutely ludicrous. Now, memory support is going to be dual channel DDR4 2400. The 2400 is quite important because some rumors have pegged the memory controller built into Ryzen as capable of supporting much higher than that. We're talking like 3000 megahertz. The problem is we don't have official confirmation um, of whether that is true. It's probably going to be unofficially supported. So in other words, it's down to you. Personally, I would suggest that if you do want to go with higher end memory, unless of course you've already got some RAM kicking around, in which case good for you. But if not, I would suggest holding off on your order, waiting for reviewers and folks to actually get hold of the memory and then start doing testing internally. And then once those results pop out, then you can buy your Ryzen. That's, you know, just some friendly advice up to you entirely. Now, moving on to the specifications of the chip, they're basically what you'd imagine. It's got the level three cache, 16 megabytes. Obviously, that's split per uh, over the four, uh, over the eight cores. So that's eight megabytes per four cores, 512 kilobytes per a core of level two cache and 65 kilobytes of level one cache, 14nm FinFET process. None of that is particularly new or revolutionary, but here's where it gets a bit weird. So the frequency multiplier adjustments are unlocked entirely, and the boost frequency is essentially unlimited, but is cooler dependent. In other words, if you have a weedier cooler, then you're not going to be able to get the clock speeds of someone with higher cooling, which makes some sense, but this also takes us into XFR, which is ex Extended Frequency Range. Some rumours have popped up on the internet from Bits and Chips, and that's the English version, which Peg Ryzen have a V-core of between 0.9, I'm just going to read that out one more time, 0.9 and 1 volt, running at 3.6 gigahertz. That's really impressive. And it basically illustrates that this processor is going to be extremely power efficient. We've talked quite in depth over the past few days about how the chip does have a very, uh, very aggressive, excuse me, um, clock gating. What that basically means is parts of the chip will shut down based upon its workload. For example, integer work only. Okay, the floating point units will shut down. It is much more complicated than that. And I have done a full um, analysis of this with the Ryzen video, but the whole chip is essentially smart. So it will try to reduce, let's say, um, lookups from memory. It will try to maxim um, uh, utilize its caches the best it can. And overall, it essentially doesn't want instructions to be going through the entire processor pipeline unless absolutely necessary. And because it has the um, advanced bra uh, branch prediction, certainly much more advanced over the previous generation of uh, AMD processors, it should at least theoretically reduce the power consumption of the chip. Now, this now starts taking us into slightly rumory slash, uh, you know, guesswork territory. However, a chap on Reddit believes he may, he thinks that the X stands, you know how we have like Ryzen 7 1800X and all of those chips. 
they believe that the X stands for, um, well, in a basically XFR enabled, which is extended frequency re- uh, range, which is basically boost clock for Zen. Now, the reason that we have this uh, um, this uh, theory is because some of the slides that AMD have released actually do have a little asterisk, which says, which says, excuse me, extended frequency range available on select AMD Ryzen processors. Excuse me for my English just being terrible today. I've just been benchmarking pretty much since I woke up, so my brain is essentially mush at this point. So what that basically means is that not all processors will have XFR available if this is true. Now, just to clarify, because I really feel it's important for you to understand, this does not mean that if you do not have an XFR chip, you will not be able to overclock. It simply means that the automated overclocking will not function. In other words, it won't, it won't be there. Um, which may or may not be a big deal to you. From what we understand from the retailer, the online retailer I was telling you about the uh, 71700 specifications, it does come packaged with a Wraith cooler. And why that's really interesting is because the boost frequency is unlimited. It's unlimited power, don't you know? That basically means it will be fully cooling dependent. Now, reality-wise, as you and I both know, Boost frequency being unlimited doesn't mean that you're going to scale indefinitely. So, for example, if you put liquid nitrogen on it, it doesn't mean you're suddenly going to get 10 gigahertz, whereas, like, a water cooling loop, you get, like, 7 gigahertz, and a high-end fan setup over, like, the Wraith cooler, you get, I don't know, 4.5 gigahertz. It just, it doesn't work like that. It obviously does mean silicon lottery, the voltages you're willing to put through it, workload, stability, and just overall your damn luck. And, of course, the motherboard itself. But what this does indicate is that really there are no finites on the chip. So you essentially you can put it as high as you want uh, within the realms and the limits of the chip. Do remember when Lisa Su at New Horizon was talking about Zen or Ryzen, she did mention multiple times that the processor would scale based upon the cooling. No. With all of this capability, we have enabled a really cool new feature just for you, our enthusiast gamers. And it's called extended frequency range. With all the sensors we have across Ryzen, our processor is smart enough to know what environment it is in. So depending on the cooling that you're using in your environment and your system, whether it's air cooling, water cooling, or even liquid nitrogen, Ryzen will sense that you have premium cooling and actually enable higher clock speeds as the system gets cooler. So in other words, it's smart enough to be able to detect heat um, dissipation. So in other words, if, for example, and obviously I'm just throwing out example figures of temperatures here, but let's say, for example, at full load, it's running at 65 degrees, it's going to realize, okay, I've got a bit more room left in the tank. On the other hand, if you've put in, let's say, a high-end water cooling loop, that same under load might be, let's say, 55, in which case it can boost even higher. On the other hand, if you start doing like liquid nitrogen, because let's say you're a hardcore overclocker, then obviously temperatures will be even lower, and the chip will know, oh, hey, I've got this ability to go up higher. Now, this does also have to take into account the constraints of power and voltage. Now, obviously, we don't know if one volt is the uh, required amount for 3.6, but let's just say it is for the sake of this video because it's a nice round figure. Okay, so let's say that the chip operates at one volt and that's the maximum that you're willing to put into it, then obviously it can't keep scaling indefinitely with the same amount of voltage because obviously silicon requires voltage to keep you know going higher in terms of clocks. So there are obviously a lot of caveats to this and quite frankly I think this chip is going to be one of those processes which is weird to learn how to overclock at the start. I think we kind of got that with various Intel CPUs back in the day, like when we started to deal with like ring voltages and all of this stuff with like the, the Haswells and God knows what else and the Skylakes. I'm sorry, not the, uh, not the Skylakes, the, uh, the Sandy Bridges. We were like, okay, this is completely different. It wasn't like we couldn't understand it. It was just different. You know, we had a whole bunch of different voltages and a whole bunch of additional memory controls and all this stuff that's built onto the CPU that we now have to stay, t- start taking 
uh, care of. And it was even back in the days of like the Athlon 64s, they were that much more complex to overclock because, well, we just didn't know what they did. So it was kind of like, okay, what impact does this voltage have over this voltage? And does it actually mean anything? Or can we get away with like having lower, um, I don't know, frequencies on this particular part of the chip and higher frequencies here? Like does, does, for example, FSB matter or whatever? And it's like, you know, those type of things we just don't know. Another thing we just don't know, and this is getting into the realms of kind of speculation on my part, but how well memory deals, for example, does Ryzen actually care so much about pure bandwidth, or is it better with t uh, tighter timings, or is it going to be something that scales differently based upon the number of cores of the processor? For example, let's say you have the uh, four-core, eight-thread processor, is it better with tighter timings? Well, on the other hand, if you've got a processor that's got eight cores, 16 threads running at a higher clock speed, that's better with more bandwidth, but obviously tighter timings do matter as well. You know, there's going to be a hell of a lot for hardcore tweakers to really care about, and um, it's going to be a learning experience, I think, for all of us. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Um, I am still doing an awful lot of benchmarking in the background. We have one graphics card almost finished. We've done the principal photography for two. We have a new testing PC, that, not one we've built, but it's been sent to us. We need to do a review on that. We've kind of got it out of the box for, oh shit, this thing is absolutely huge. We need to clear space to actually film it, so that's going to be done uh, hopefully over the next couple of days. We have the press event footage that I've just transferred onto a PC, so that's going to be pretty cool, where um, we went to MSI's uh, press event in London, so that's kind of nice. So you get to see us, like, you know, moseying around trying out some laptops and doing other bits and pieces. And there's going to be some other bits and bobs coming up on the channel as well, like some memory reviews. So that's why uh, content has just been a bit hit and miss the last few days. I can only apologise. But hopefully you have still been enjoying it. And thank you everyone who's been writing to us, messaging us, tweeting us, and, well, subscribing to us, commenting, and all of that stuff. Your support is greatly appreciated. Anyway, I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.